Hey, welcome back. Transgender is an umbrella term for persons whose gender identity or expression, masculine, feminine, is different than their sex that they were actually born with, male or female. Gender identity refers to one's internal understanding of one's own gender or the gender with which a person identifies. Gender expression is a term used to describe people's outward presentation of their gender. Now, gender identity and sexual orientation are different facets of identity. Everyone has a gender identity and a sexual orientation, but a person's gender does not determine a person's sexual orientation. Transgender people may identify as heterosexual, homosexual, or even bisexual. Are you confused yet? It can be, but the bigger question that I propose is how judgmental are you? Why does it really matter? Or how does this actually affect your life? Can a biological male be a lesbian? Now, if this question seems crazy, then you're probably not that far off from a lot of people out there, and probably because you're unaware of this paradigm. Now, this paradigm says that a trans woman can count as a lesbian, and actually many do. Though precise statistics aren't available, many trans women are exclusively female attracted. Now, prior to transition, they're what we would call straight or a heterosexual males that are attracted to opposite biological sex. Now, when transition occurs, this pattern of attraction usually persists. But for some, it's unacceptable to now think of themselves as straight for this carries with it a lingering connotation of manhood that's now ultimately rejected. So some trans women self-identify as lesbians. So stay tuned for my guest today, Sophie White, who is an actress. She is a producer. She is a director and fits this exact category. Please stay tuned and I will see you in a minute. classifies as a health hazard. I wouldn't notice. I've been in there all day. Yeah. What's wrong? Charlie hasn't responded to any of my phone calls, texts, emails, letters. What's going on? His mother didn't leave in the house. She left it to AA. And because they're selling it, he needs to get out. Thank God you made it. I'm back. Are you sure? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm good. Hey, thanks for everything. Okay, let's get high. And there is no better time than now. My name is Eric McCoy. Welcome back to High Wall Clean. You know, what people don't understand causes hatred for reasons that I personally can't really understand. Because to me, this actually is what makes life exciting. You know, our journey can be confusing at times. And the sad part is that much of the hatred that others have for those they don't understand are just as confusing sometimes for those that are dealing with it. 
is what I actually found. And what I find fascinating, and this will make a little more sense once I introduce my guest today, are those individuals that are filled with judgment and condemnation that say things are choices, meaning that they, I believe, at some point in time struggled with the very thing and made a choice to go the other direction. Otherwise, they wouldn't be able to say that. (laughs) And I'm very excited to introduce my guest today and who has dealt with the very same dilemma that my son has dealt with. And my son, as I've mentioned numerous times on my show, was born a female, transitioned to a male. And I also have my very dear friend, Lona Curie, the transgender mentor and also my co-host of Walk a Mile in My Shoes. Sophie White has been in the entertainment industry for many years in lots of different roles. And it wasn't long ago that she officially came out as a transgender. And she is that picture of courage, as I see it, and living in a world that is becoming more accepting, but still not to where I believe we would really like things to be. Sophie, I want to thank you for joining me on this show, and I really appreciate that you're going to hook me up on a very small role in a movie just because I want to say that I've been there and done it. You know, I have a I don't really want to be famous, but I've had that bucket list of that way I can just say I did it. <laughs> Sophie, how, how are you doing? I am doing wonderful. Um, we are trying to recover from the hurricane and mm-hmm. we're just moving along slowly. Very good. And uh, I want to let you know that you are a beautiful woman. Um, I've looked you up in the other ways. You're actually kind of an ugly man. So stick with the woman. <laughs> now, as I, as I told you when we were on the phone, um, I'm gonna, I do want to also book you on Lona Curie's show with me. And it's not really my show, but I'm going to book you. And, <laughs> you know, we talked about the difference between, you know, his transition from female to male and how much more difficult I think it is for the male to female transitions for a lot of people. And his response to me was just so right on. And they are my heroes. And I would have to agree because of courage. So Sophie, I want to let you know that you got some huge fans out there. You know, the entertainment industry is a field that is, I I think, and, and you can kind of answer this for me a little more accepting than other fields in some cases out there. And I believe a little bit, maybe because actors and actresses have to play different roles, which probably creates an empathetic view in some ways, which is exactly what I do as a counselor, you know, as we work to understand people. And I wanted to actually ask you that question real quick from your perspective. How has that been for you? Well, the, the movie industry is very, very liberal, usually. Um, and I think a lot of that is we walk in other people's shoes, especially actors. We tend to try and get into other people's issues and problems and who they are and, and try and understand those people. And doing so, I think we build up a, an openness to other cultures and other people. I, I thought it was a lot easier to come out to my people in the movie industry a lot easier than the general public. Um, although I really haven't had a hard transition, um, everybody's been pretty accepting, but no transition is easy. Sure. Absolutely. Now you are, um, you're married. I'm married kids and, um, I've been married 31 years and looks like we'll stay married and uh, things are doing well. Yeah. And that is, uh, how has your, um, how is your kids felt about all this the kids seem to be fine anybody under i find probably 25 or so they really don't care like you tell them oh i'm trans and they'll go okay cool and they move on uh where somebody in my age group you know you tell them that and they look at you you know a little weird for a while and sometimes they move on and sometimes you know they'll come with all kind of questions and um like i said i really haven't had a lot of people um 
talk to me negatively or stuff like that. I'm sure that's to come, but um, it, it's been it's been okay, especially my hometown because I'm from a very red state. I'm in Louisiana, mm-hmm. so being in a very um, place that you would typically think would be horrible to come out as trans, it really hasn't been that bad, um, you know, at least to my face. <laughs> I want to ask you a little bit on your history, Um, and I'm always kind of curious on this. How long have you known this? Um, That's an interesting question. I I would say for sure 20-something years. I don't know exactly. Um, I've been trying to work that out with my therapist exactly. What If you take my life and you look at all the pieces and parts, you can see pieces scattered throughout the whole lifetime. But I was oblivious most of my life. Um, Until about probably 20 years ago, maybe 23, 25 years ago. Um, It it was like a switch that went on. And then I spent another 15 years trying to deny it. So going back to when you were, you know, really young, did you didn't really kind of have this confusion or? Um, I, I mean, I did a lot of things that would be considered female-ish. I, you know, I, I was a member of the Glee Club. I, I um, did dance. I did, um, you know, just a lot of things that were, you know, I, I noticed that I felt more comfortable in female groups. I, you know, I hated being in the guys' locker rooms. Uh, you know, there's so many little bitty things. Like you say, individually, they're no big deal. But if you put them all together, you can kind of see it happen. You know, I kind of mentioned, um, I was, you know, thinking on, if you were looking at um, the statistical factor, more males to females, are they more in that line of, like the lesbian, I guess, you know, again, kind of going back to if you do do the full transition that you would be identified as a lesbian. Is that? Well, I I guess I would identify as a lesbian, but they still like them. Mm -hmm. So um, sex and gender are not the same thing. Everybody wants to link them together, but they're absolutely completely different. Some people, when they transition, do transition. If they, it, it seems like if you were, um, you know, it, it seems like you can switch over. Some people have, I've known a number of people that have, um, and some don't, it really, it depends on the person, I guess. Now we talked a little bit on the phone too, about substance abuse that you had struggles with substance abuse, right? Well, I, I think I didn't have a substance abuse problem, but I wound up in the hospital, um, with a bleeding also from, from, so I guess I have a substance abuse problem. You know, we, we tend to say, oh, it's no big deal. It's, it's, um, I think one of the biggest things that I, I was amazed with is when I tried to quit, I was able to, just because of how heavy I was drinking. Um, you know, we always find, I guess, um, a potion or a pill or something to, to numb us from, what's going on in our lives. And I think that kind of runs across everybody. Um, I was lucky mine was alcohol and I've been able to control it. Um, you know, although I can, what I've done is I've got a, a half gallon of rum and that's my barometer, whether I'm doing good or bad, <laughs> depending on how fast I finish it. Mm-hmm. So, um, like I said, I, about, I guess four or five years ago, um, I wound up in the hospital Actually, I come home from, um, I was going to go to see a movie that I had worked on and decided I didn't want to go see it. And so I came home and I grabbed a beer and I took one sip and I was like, I don't feel good. I told my wife I'm going to go lay down for a minute. So I went in bed and 15 minutes later, I'm throwing up blood in, in the bathroom. Mm-hmm. And I said, you need to take me to the ER. We got to the ER and I started really throwing up blood. Um, wound up spending several days in a hospital with a perforated ulcer, um, and which was contributed directly to drinking. I was drinking probably about three quarters of a bottle of rum a night. Wow. Uh, so, I mean, that was heavy, heavy drinking. But, and, and the thing was, nobody really knew I was drinking. 
Um, I would come home. I'd get a 36-ounce tumbler, fill it with um, rum and a splash of Diet Coke, and I would do it four or five times a night. You know, and it's a lot if you think about it. After a while, it really – I did that for years. Mm. Uh, and finally, it caught up to me. You know, it, it's like, well, I'm not an alcoholic because I don't drink before – you know, no, yeah. I'm good. As we know, like having an alcohol problem and believing you have one is two different things, right? <laughs> right. It's absolutely two different things. And, you know, um, after I wound up in the hospital, I realized I had a problem. Um, and it really, it kind of hits at home. And, you know, it, it, there's so many things that I wish I'd have done differently then. But And how long ago was that? Um, that was, I'm trying to think of, that was right about four years ago now. It, time keeps changing, so it's hard to keep up right. with exactly when that was. But see the four or five years ago. Um, it was right as I was coming out, but I wasn't out yet. Mm. Um, what happened was, um, seven years ago, my mother and brother died on the same day or the same weekend. Um. And when they did, you know, it really kind of hit me pretty, really hard. Um, a, two years later, I had another incident that happened similar to that, probably even worse than that. Um, and then um, when that was finally over, I started, um, I became pretty suicidal. Mm. And I started looking for things that would just, you know, get me out of this and not worry about it. And drinking was part of that. Um, and I was heading back, it was, um, October 16th, I was heading back from Austin, um, Texas from a, I'd gone to a writing conference there and on my way home, I started to place to kill myself. And, um, I wound up calling a friend instead. Um, and they directed me to get a counselor. Um, I reached out to a counselor, but. One thing about reaching out to a counselor, everybody thinks you get better when you do that. And actually, it's not quite true because you kind of actually, I think it gets more real and you get really closer to the edge when that happens. Um, that was that was in the beginning or the middle of uh, October. and the end of October, I went to New York um, to visit. I had a screenplay that had won a contest. So I went up there to accept the award. And when I was there, and a friend of mine showed me her veranda up our 17th floor uh, across from Rockefeller Center, their, their wonderful view of New York. And all I could think about was jumping. That mindset that you get into, where you, you're, it, I mean, it's horrible. It, and that's what you want to escape. You want to try and get out of that. Um, right after that was when, on the day of my mother and brother, well, my, the day my mother died, um, the, the anniversary, which was, I think it was either two or three years after that had happened, probably three years. Um, I was going to see a, a movie that I worked on, decided not to go, and that's when I wound up in the hospital. And during that time, I wouldn't tell anybody what I was taking. I was on hormones. I was on other stuff. I was self-medicating. Um, and, you know, getting it off the internet, which is probably the worst thing you can do because you don't know exactly what you get. Right. Um, and it, it was just, after I got out, I was like, you know, how stupid are you? You're going to die because you're too embarrassed to tell anybody what's going on. And I wound up um, with the encouragement of my counselor to actually get a real doctor. Um, then after that, the next year, in January, I said, "Okay, I'm, I'm coming out. I, I can't, I can't continue to do this. It's gonna either I come out or I jump off something." And I wound up coming out, and it was it was definitely a very interesting time. What I did was um, the first three or four months, I would uh, when I would go do movies or I would go to New Orleans. I live actually about sixty miles outside. Um, I would um, go with Sophie. And then finally one day I decided that's it. I, it needs to be all the time. You know, you know talking about with, um, you know, opening up and sharing 
this is what I, and I talked to, you know, with the industry, you know, working in the substance abuse industry, you know, people, you know, when you look at what were the reasons why people use and most people, you know, use to numb themselves, to avoid life, to avoid responsibilities, you know, or, um, you know, not have to deal with, you know, certain things such as, you know, things that you were dealing with. And when they first come into treatment, I think the worst thing in the world that we can do is to really kind of hound on, tell me all your traumas, tell me all the issues you're dealing with, tell me all these things. Cause those, you know, in that period of time, people run a lot of times, you know, I don't want to talk about this shit, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and, and I believe that, you know, when I work with people that it's so important for them to bring it up, you know, or them to, when, when they're ready to talk about certain things that it's not forced out or it's not pushed out, you know? Um, and then obviously dealing with major depression, as you were saying with, you know, obviously suicidal ideation, like it's more complicated. Um, but you obviously figured out what was causing most of that stuff. And, and that's amazing is that once I transitioned, I would say the suicidology completely left, although I, I'm sure I'm going to deal with it because I do deal with it every now and then a little bit. And I guess for one thing to be that hard on you, it, it, it's just incredible that it could be that simple too at the same time. Yeah. And I, I can just imagine that, you know, with, you know, my co-host Lona, you know, he never changed his name and he's kind of, you know, and, and yeah. sticking with Lona, but um, we, we, you know, we talked a lot about this too. And in, in that, you know, he also waited to much later in life, you know, to come out. Um, but he also lives in like North Carolina, the Bible state, you know, it's not even quite as easy. <laughs> I was, I was trying to run out the clock. I was going to like, this is not going to come out. Nobody's going to know about this. Mm. Uh, but when it got to that point, and then what I did was, one thing I think I did right was I decided to take the narrative and tell the story I wanted to tell. Because people want to talk to you, talk about you no matter what. Mm -hmm. And now I'm, I'm going to get them my story, not just, you know, and that's one thing I did was I took, I guess, about 50 people and I sat them down and I told them the whole story. I told them about the suicide. I told them about, you know, and it's not once. <laughs> You know, it, it's, it's kind of a multiple thing that, that you go on and sitting down, sitting down with them and telling them it, it was, they got it, you know, they understood it, I think. And I think that was one of the biggest things I did right. If you were to share the, you know, what it's like, what it feels like, what, what, you know, it's going on within you for the people that don't understand, what would you, what would you say? Well, I guess the big, biggest thing would be to describe depression. Um, depression is different than you think it is. Um, it's not wanting to get out of bed. Sometimes it's your hygiene goes down. You're, you're mm -hmm. just, I don't want to do this. I don't want to go out. You know, I just drag an ass. I, I, my work uh, stuff is falling off slowly, you know, over 15, 20 years. It's not like it's, you know, it's not a cut, cut and dry issue. A lot, of, a lot of times it comes on very, very slowly, at least mine did. Um, and it just kept getting worse and worse and worse. So I got to a point of breaking. Mm -hmm. um, and I think what happens, at least what I've seen a lot of times is, a major event will trigger it, and then you got to hold on to the ride. And mine was my brother and mother, and my, this other thing that happened. Those were the three things that just, you know, said, "Hey, something's going to change." So now you're you're. How long has your wife known? She's known for a little while, um, a lot longer than what she says, but um, I would say in that. 15, 18 years, maybe, maybe longer. So she's kind of known. It's, it's been, it was the elephant in the room that nobody would talk about. Um, and then, you know, when it got to the suicidal stuff, um, I felt like I couldn't go to her, which I wish I would have been able to do. Um, so, 
Because why? I don't know. I just didn't feel like I could. I, you know, we didn't talk about certain things, and that was one thing we didn't talk about because every time we tried to, we had issues with it. And she's been wonderful. Uh, you know, it, it kind of worked out well, but it wasn't planned that way. Love, for instance, right? <laughs> I mean, it, and I think this really goes to that. I mean, like, I think the least important part of love is is physical you know it's more of the internal you know true genuine love that you have for somebody which it sounds like she has yeah you know um and that's incredible that we you know we've been together like i said 30 31 years oh it'll be 31 years this year which is uh next month um and it's been it's been an incredible journey it really has uh you know, our, our children are now grown up and they're out of the house. And the last six months or so, it's like we're getting back to when we were first married. You know, and just having fun again and doing stuff, going places. And, you know, before I I didn't want to do stuff. I, I you know, Although sometimes you just kind of do stupid stuff because you're trying to occupy your mind. I, I race formula cars because, you know, I, I it would take me away from everything and you had to pay attention you are who you are and and, and love who you are you know <laughs> i mean i you know this it, it's something for me you know because again i had a major meth problem i mean that almost killed me i was you know looking at 15 years in prison in 2002 you know for four arrests in six months and i hated myself you know yeah um and I, you know, I eventually got to that place of, you know, love me or hate me. This is me, you know, I'm just going to be me. Cause a lot of times, you know, I mean, obviously I'm not dealing with, you know, the stuff you're dealing with, but you know, a lot of us are trying to be other people or we're trying to be, you know, who we think other people want us to be. Expectations. We want to be everybody's expectation. And yeah. then my problem is um, I've always wanted to be one. I want to be felt like I was being needed or wanted and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you look at my credentials in my life, it's they're impressive, but to me, it wasn't, it wasn't enough. It's never it's mm -hmm. always lacking somewhere. Yeah. You're the hardest on yourself. Oh, absolutely. And I don't think people understand that how hard we are on ourselves and getting to the place to where you don't care what other people think. Well, in mine, I got to that point. I really, I got to that breaking point where it's, you know, you just go, that's it. I, I have no more. I can't go anymore. I can't. Yeah, you either do what you need to do or you kill yourself, right? Which is a horrible way to be, but it, that's reality. Yeah, absolutely. So how's the, uh, so how is your work going? How are you doing in, in uh... well, um, 2019, I had an unbelievable year, um, right before the pandemic, uh, I was on Chicago Med as a top of show, which is one of the main characters of the show, of that show, uh, season five, episode six. Um, I had, I was in 14 movies, uh, three series and one play in 2019. Um, and then COVID slammed on the brakes. Um, I just, um, I have been, auditioning a whole bunch lately i got a lot of casting directors that like me but nobody seems to want to put me somewhere yeah do you kind of find that so you kind of find that a little difficult at times to get certain roles or to get roles um it is a wonderful and horrible profession it's very hard to make money um you got to be super disciplined with money to be able to sustain it or have another source of income where you can leave when you need to um you know, it, it's tough. It, it, it really is. Um, I'm working on a, trying to get a reality series off the ground called Transgender Streaming Across America, where we go um, to other people in other places, people that love us and people that hate us. And, you know, how do we re interact with them? And it should be interesting. It really, I think timing is good for it. Um, so. Yeah, now you've done a lot of uh, producing over the years. Director of photography, I've done a lot of that stuff. Okay. 
Um, and it's just more recent that you got into acting. Is that correct? Uh, I started acting uh, in 2019. That was my first year, oh. which is incredible to have that much going on your first year, including hitting top of show in your first year. It's, it's, it doesn't happen. Mm-hmm. So, um, but I guess it does because it happened to me. But it, it's, you know, it's quite incredible, actually, if you think about it, to go from nowhere to, to there. And I was ready for the, They say it takes three large breaks to, to make a career. I've had one. <laughs> I'm waiting for the other two large breaks to happen. So we'll see if they, if they have it. Yeah, just keep fighting for it, you know? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. That's my, that's my motto. I always say, no matter where you've been or what you've done, you can do anything you want if you're willing to fight for it. Yeah. Yes. Well, and I think that's partly going back to depression, being able to fight for it. being Because like when I was um, doing a lot of DP work towards the last, I guess, five or six years that I was doing that, um, I couldn't make a decision. I couldn't say, oh, that was a good shot. Even though it's probably better than most people's shots, I, I, that, that's what depression really looks like. It, it's that not wanting to make that decision, not, not feeling good about making a decision, not being confident. Yeah, and I think that's, you know, I, one of my big fights on this is I fight the stigma of substance abuse and also mental illness. And, um, and I think, you know, again, it just goes, there's a lot of people that just don't understand it. Right. And, um, and when you don't understand it, you hate it, you know, or, or you think people are faking it or whatever, you know, that, that people yeah. believe. Right. And, uh, and that's why for me, I mean, I love having people like you on, on the show, you know, you know, with good stories, good stories of courage, you stand up, you know, you're. You can be proud. Um, I don't know if you're fully there yet, or well, I'm still struggling with it. I, I you know, because I still, it's getting there. It's getting better, you know? and every day, like I said, it's it's a lot of all the depression is going away, and a lot of the other stuff. But it's still, I'm struggling. You know, just being trans. Sometimes I want to tell people that I am, and other times I just let me be who I am. Did your and did your wife have uncomfortabilities going out in the beginning or? Oh yeah, very uncomfortable. Um, it, and you know, just think about it. Um, you're going from a traditional heterosexual relationship to a lesbian relationship. I mean, that's, it, it's tough. It's tough on them, and you know, they go through their own transition, so to speak, in that or the marriage falls apart. Um, about a third of the people over 50 um, where one partner's transition make it and uh, under 50 it's about 50 percent which I, I think is a little more encouraging what would you tell families that are going through that it's a journey not a destination hmm. um, enjoy the journey I mean it's going to be highs it's going to be lows it's going to be it's going to be everything um, you know, it, it's find some people that you can identify with and friend them or talk to them and see how to work through some of this stuff. Some of these, some of these, we it seems like a lot of our stories are almost exactly the same. Um, you know, so there's people out there that have made it that have, you know, kind of the same position that you were in. They feel like you do. And that's one thing when I started to start talking about it, um, I really wanted to do was to to give people hope that, you know, when I, when I first, before I transitioned, I heard all the horror stories, you know, everybody's going to disown you, you're going to lose your family, you lose everything, you're going to lose your employment, you're not going to be employable. It, it, it's, and a lot of it wasn't true. Now for some people, it's very true. Um, I had a good friend of mine, Emma, who, um, wound up going to her, her father's house and um, he was like, you're not coming to this place, you know, dress, in a dress and that kind of stuff. And she wound up killing herself in front of the whole family. Mm. You know, so it's, it can be really, really bad. And, a lot, and that would have been so simple if her dad would have just said, I don't understand it, but I accept you as my child, mm-hmm. you know, 
but because he didn't, she's dead. Wow. So. You know, as you were saying, age too, you know, I mean, the, I think the older parents, you know, probably have a much harder time with it than obviously the younger parents, maybe a little bit more accepting and open to it. I think that age, the further up in age you go, the harder it is. Although you never know because people that I thought would be super accepting, not all of them were. It's like, I thought my little brother was going to be horrible. I thought he was going to, you know, start on the rants and the religion and all that. And he's been unbelievable. Um, You know, we judge we judge pe- how people are going to react, and we have no clue of how they're going. So, and, and every day I learn something new. Uh, you know, I see the world from a completely different point of view now. It's, it's been incredible. It's an amazing journey. It is an amazing journey. It definitely is a journey. I like I like how you said that too. I mean, it is. It's you know, life life is a journey. We go through all kinds of different. I mean, all of us go through transitions in, in different aspects in life, and. Um, and that, and that to me is the exciting part. You know, I, I love it. I, every morning I wake up and I'm excited about what's going to happen today. And if you can just get excited about what's going to happen today, yeah. you know, just taking those little victories sometimes, you know, yeah. slowing down sometimes and just smelling the roses, you know, it, it just get back to, you know, one thing I started trying to do was to get back to being like a kid uh, again and looking at life from a child's point of view, it's just how amazing it really is. We got one life, right? One life to live and let's make it the best we can. Yeah. And the problem is I, you know, didn't live for 15 years, you know? So, and that, you know, it's a shame. There's so much I wish I had done. Different. It's the only moment we can enjoy, enjoy is right here and right now. Absolutely. And right now. Right now, <laughs> right now. <laughs> yeah. you know, the past is gone. The future is nothing but expectations. And all we have is now. Now we got a plan for the future, of course, but, but the only moment we can enjoy is now. Yeah. And that's what I've been trying to do. And I think I'm doing okay with it. You know, there's several things that were phenomenally hard to do. The first time you walk outside and from, you know, in female clothes, at least for me. Um, that was tough. Um, telling the first person that you're transgender, mm. that was really hard. Um, you know, and it, it get, got easier, got easier, got easier. And, you know, now it's, you know, I got to the point where I just, yeah, I'll talk about it if I feel like it. Or not. Do you think at all it was because maybe you struggled with accepting it yourself at first? Oh, absolutely. I think that because another thing is I bottled up all my emotions. I bottled them up, bottled them up. I wouldn't. When I, I used to work um, um, Fulton County 911 downtown Atlanta. I worked at Grady Hospital. I worked on campus. And I built up some really good walls um, with my emotions. I wouldn't show anybody anything. Somebody's dying. Like, okay. You know, we're fine. We're, we're, it's not me. We're good. Let's go on. Um, and you build up these walls and all that. And then I started building more and more walls. Like when I finally came out and started dressing full time at the office, it's like somebody walked in and it's like, hey, how you doing? I'm trans. You know, the mailman, <laughs> hey, I'm trans. You know, it, it, and I think a lot of them, I could, once I opened it up, I couldn't stop talking. Um, and that took a couple of years like that, where it's just, you know, you, you just finally release and all that stuff that you blocked for 20, 30 years, whatever how long it's been. And, you know, it's definitely, it comes out, it's coming out and you can't stop it once it starts. Yeah. You know, like yeah. Cause I think once you accept it, you know, then, then it does probably become easier. Oh, absolutely. And, uh, and then I think, you know, cause again, I, I think, and I kind of think about this a lot is that, you know, identifying as a transgender or identifying as whatever it is, that's not you. I mean, you're, you're you, you know? Yeah. Um, and that's, you know, um, 
did you, and you kind of find that that way in terms of like, you were kind of saying like, you just identify transgender, 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 but that's not you. I mean, as a person. Yeah. Uh, well, absolutely. We, um, it's labels. Um, yeah. Like people say, well, you change so much. And it's like, I don't feel I've changed at all. I'm still the exact same person I was. I dress a little differently. You know, I've got great, them my pool over there. <laughs> you know, it, it's, but it's true. We, we, you know, we, we want to label everything. We, we want to stick labels on stuff. It doesn't make who we are. No. Um, I, I really don't feel like I've changed that much. Yeah. Yeah. We identify who we are and just be us, you know? Yeah. Labels is, you know, I, you know, people just, I don't, you know, I'm depressed or I'm, you know, this, or I'm that I'm, you know, and, and you throw all these labels on yourself and, but no, that's not who you are. Right. You know, and, uh, you know, and that was a struggle for me for a lot of years. I mean, first of all, it was just because of my drug use. Um, I didn't know who I was, you know, well, when, that's true. Cause we mask everything. And I think a lot of that is finding to, when I actually quit drinking, I, it really became apparent who I was started slowly back and then, you know, had something, uh, three, four months ago that happened. It's like, geez. And then got snapped out of it by something else and, you know, back to, um, doing pretty good. And I think a lot of it is getting rid of all the baggage. Um, Mm -hmm. once you get rid of the baggage, so much goes away. So if you were to, if you were to say something to people out there struggling, what would you tell them? There's always tomorrow. Things always change. No matter how bad it gets, it will change. Um, and just try and steer it in the right direction. That's the best thing you can do. Every, everything changes. Everything. The world is changing all the time. Yep. And we need to be, we need to be, uh, be prepared for it. Right. It's yeah. like the weather in South Louisiana. If you don't like it, just give it 24 hours. It'll be different. Go. Yep. And then if you come to California, just give it nine months. Uh, <laughs> we don't, our weather doesn't change much here. <laughs> I hear you. Um, well, hey, I want to thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate it. I really appreciate it. I, you know, I, I, I started in 2019 where I started really just trying to get out, and tell my message and stuff like that. And then they kind of shut up. We're still, we're still plugging along yeah. and i think it's important i really do and I'm, I'm really um you know i'm really glad that you do that you know that you do go out and you do talk about it because it is going to help other people yeah and um and that way also that people don't feel they're alone in it all oh absolutely i started writing the column a uh, couple of things that you know just talking about it writing about it has done so much for me personally, just mm-hmm. to get it off my chest more than anything, just to be able to talk about it, be able to write about it. Um, they say, you know, write about what, um, what hurts you and everybody will care. Mm-hmm. You know, and, uh, I started writing for Baltimore Out Loud uh, under Sophie's Choice. Uh, it's a column that I have. I've been writing it for two years now. Um, and I, you know, I talk about everything from me and my dad. I, you know, like my dad's getting older and he's, um, has a little dementia. So it's like, why are you wearing a dress? And he'll ask me a hundred times. You know, why are you a dress? And I keep telling him and, you know, it's, it's interesting. He's never mean about it. He's such a nice guy that, you know, but still he finds it funny. And, well, and I think that, you know, you're, you're never going to get everybody to understand. I don't understand. I don't know if it's understandable. I, it, it's, I've gotten to the point where I just accept it. Yeah. Kind of. You know, for years, I tried to figure it out. I read everything out there on being transgender and the whys and hows, and everybody's got theories, but I, who knows? Yeah. So it's, a, it's something non explainable. <laughs> At least not right now. The number of theories that I like, you know, some of it's about the how much estrogen or testosterone you bathed with when you were in the uterus. You yeah. know? Uh, we, we don't know. Nobody knows. But I can tell you that it's, for me, it's surreal. 
Um, mm-hmm. It's not something, you know, we're not trying to get attention or anything else like that. Um, you know, 46% of us attempt suicide. Yeah. Not think about it, attempt. Yeah. So actually do things that towards ending our lives. And those kind of numbers are crazy and something needs to be done. Yeah. Yeah. Lona and I did a, one of our episodes of walk a mile in my shoes and we did it on transgender and it was a uh, Walt. I don't remember the guy's last name, Walt Heil, I think it was. And he was an individual who um, transgendered as, as an older person, I think in his forties or fifties. And then he realized it was a mistake. And, um, and then he goes out and he's this very outspoken person, you know, um, in the, in the God, you know, idea of this is wrong and things like that. Right. Cause our, the walk a mile in my shoes, we've kind of targeted the hate, you know, aspects of things. And after we did the show, it dawned on me, you know, and I was thinking about it that, you know, we have a condition that is based on the irregularity of, of hormones, right. In, in utero, um, hermaphrodites. Yeah. Right. And so if it's possible for there to be an external confusion, right. Where you may have, you know, vice versa male having more of a vagina and, you know, kind of thing. Why is it not possible for there to be an internal convert, you know, confusion? You know, it kind of dawned on me one day when I was, after we did the show, I kind of, I kind of added something later than I kind of put it in the beginning of it because it, um, it kind of made sense to me a little, you know, when I, when I thought about it in that light. Well, the, um, the Native Americans used to do a thing called two spirits, um, before that was, um, where they, you know, not really male, not really female, but kind of embody both. And they were really revered, you know, back, way back and stuff like that, where the two spirits were somebody that can understand both males. So I can tell you there is a difference between male and female, the way you respond, the way you, you know, it, like one day I was coming back um, from set, it was three o'clock in the morning, I stopped at Waffle House. I always stop anywhere when I was working on the ambulance. We went to Waffle House in the ghetto, and it was no big deal. Um, but I was, as a female, got to an opera house. There's four or five guys standing around outside. And you start thinking, do I really want to go in? Yeah. Am I going to be harassed? Am I going to be, you know, and you start understanding privileges you never saw that you had. You never thought you had it. And now all of a sudden you're starting to understand it. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, you get to see both sides of the, of the world. Yeah. Which is truly incredible. Yeah. Again, um, we just need to treat it like that, and hopefully, other people will start to understand. Yeah. Yeah. Keep pushing forward and helping people find that courage. You know. <laughs> Trying to. Yeah. Along, slowly but surely. Absolutely. Well, hey, I want to thank you again for doing this. I really appreciate it. And anytime you need anything, just holler. Absolutely. I want to thank everybody for tuning in to another episode of High Wall Clean. Let's keep getting high, but let's do it clean. I'll see you guys soon.